one. Is it going? Yeah. Yeah. Hi there, everyone. Uh, decided to forego any more COVID stuff, though who knows? That might change. But in any case, I wanted to do something that I've been thinking about doing for quite a while, which is to talk about how I personally got into astrology. Why I, a quote, PhD philosopher, unquote, would go into this subject, which has been declared nonsense for 300 years, basically, ever since the dawn of science. And, um, and I was a philosopher of science, so definitely a conversion. So I want to talk about that conversion, and that means talk about what I was like before leading up to it and why I find it so important to absorb the language of astrology in my life. Okay. So, uh, my first experience of astrology was when I was a very young uh, married woman in an unhappy marriage, and uh, Johnny Lister came to town, and Johnny Lister was kind of like a, uh, what do you call it, an entertainer, but he was an astrologer, but he was an entertainer, and my mother brought him to the house for all of us to experience Johnny Lister's predictions, uh, uh, astrological predictions, and she wasn't into astrology, but it was like entertainment for her. So when it got to me, he said, what's your sun sign? When were you born? So I said, Sagittarius. He said, when was your husband born? I said, September 10th, um, and he, uh, Virgo. And he goes, oh, he says, well, those signs don't get along very well. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you got divorced, which, you know, at the time really bothered me because how dare you talk like that? And, and it still bothers me that anyone would say such a thing uh, because of course Virgo and Sagittarius, even though they are 90 degrees apart in the zodiac, so very, very different, can get along if the people are conscious. And that's always true for any sign. It depends on conscious you are. And I in fact live with a Virgo right now. In fact, I've attracted Virgos to me all my life because I need to learn more detailed consciousness rather than just the constant wide overview, which is what interests me most. Okay, so that was my first experience, and I just dismissed it, of course, and yet I got divorced very soon after, not because of that, but he did predict it, and he was right. Okay, then, but I was a very good girl um, because I was a very conscientious Catholic, okay? A saint. I mean, I was truly a saint. I hardly ever sinned, or I tried not to very hard. <laughs> Went to confession if I did and so forth. Very dogmatic in my, my belief system. I really felt that it was, I, it was true, and I felt sorry for my friends who weren't Catholic because they were going to go to hell. And I just really prayed for them that they would convert to Catholicism so that they wouldn't go to hell. So that's the kind of fundamentalist, uh, dogmatic, um, religious person that I was as a child. In other words, there was a particular set of beliefs that I subscribed to wholeheartedly. It's like, think of it as a conceptual helmet that I was wearing, just like this. It was a conceptual helmet, and nothing got in and nothing got out because why should it? It was, it was reality. It was the real thing. Okay, so then I went to, then I went to uh, graduate school in philosophy, and really my original reason for going to philosophy was not because I wanted to learn larger ways of thinking, which philosophy does give you if you really go into it, very seldom does that happen in academia, but it was destined to happen to me. In any case, um, what was I going to say about that? Going to philosophy. Oh, but my original reason was because I wanted to learn how to translate from one language to another, and that I thought that could be a career for me, a translation, which is interesting because I've been terrible with foreign languages all my life. And uh, my husband, though, my fourth husband, the one where the marriage actually worked until he died 12 years later, was a translator. Uh, he translated uh, German and Russian mathematics into English. And it's funny, I thought I could do that. But the point is, sometimes the motivation that you have when you start something is really not the real motivation. The motivation is explored later or is understood later. So I had this reason for going into philosophy that wasn't real. 
Uh, and then I met a person that was my teacher. Uh, and I, in the true sense of the word, he was my mentor. He was my um, Don Juan, uh, you know, my the guy that showed me the way. He didn't even mean to. It wasn't like he was actually um, all that enlightened. But what he was, was he knew the limits of the worldview of science. And because by that time, I had started to fall away from Catholicism because I was refusing to get pregnant again. I knew that wasn't good for me. And that meant I had to use birth control, which at the time in the church was forbidden. So I had to choose my body or my beliefs, so I chose my body. It was the first real choice I ever made. So there I was, without my conceptual helmet. It was like crumbled, what am I gonna do? So I had to find another one. Well, what's the other one in our world? Science, religion and science. Those are the two that we usually subscribe to, one or, one or the other, or possibly both, but they are in an uneasy alliance, if any. Okay, so I was gonna go into science, and my teacher was a philosopher of science, among other things, but he taught me pretty soon on that there's no such thing as proof, no such thing as proving an assumption, which is your deepest conjectures, is true. You can't prove it. In other words, it's always a conceptual helmet. Everything that we put on is a conceptual helmet, and there's a wide open space beyond it, which we do not understand, but which is equally real. Now, he didn't talk like that. The way he talked was, there's a limit to logic, and logic is how we get from one place to another using the mind, using the left brain of the mind, that is. During this same time in graduate school, I was also discovering that there is a, a distinction between left brain and right brain. I think it was in some kind of science magazine that my husband got, and I thought, wow, really? There's a left brain and a right brain, and then there's a course of corpus callosum which joins these brains together, and the left brain was logic, rationality, all the things that they teach in school that they say that if you, if you master it, you're smart. But then there's the right brain where dreams are, where visions are, where spaciousness is, where infinity lies, where, where just um, a whole different attitude towards life, which is much more surrendered to the heart, lies. And, you know, I saw that there, and I thought, wow, what's that? But I didn't go there, but I, what is that? Okay, so I'm still trying to be a good girl. I'm still trying to, in other words, uh, be a philosopher of science, even though my teacher knows that it, 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 there's a dead end there. It, it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, that's all he knew. He didn't. He couldn't go any further. But he encouraged me to go further. He encouraged me to explore the assumptions that I had in life, whatever they were. And he basically he he didn't announce it, but he his attitude said, "I will support you, no matter what." So I started digging, you know, we call it rabbit holes now, and I did, I started digging into rabbit holes of my own mind. And the further I got, um, the, more, uh, the more I had to let go of. I just kept going down and down and down until I finally reached the place of the conceptual helmet that everybody wears, which has to do with, quote, common sense. Okay, common sense lies under everything. But this happens to be, in our culture, a common sense where we have no senses in common. Isn't that weird? And I start, rec start recognizing that. And why is that? It's because of a, an assumption that was made in the 17th, 18th century that the mind and the body are split off from one another and that the only thing that is real in terms of being a person is one's mind. I think, therefore I am, said Descartes. Therefore, only my thinking is me. So the body turns out to be a machine that you drag around with you. That's kind of how we feel in our lives at this point. And I think, you know, going back to COVID, that's the main problem, that the fear of the body, because we're so disconnected from it, we want to think of it as a machine. It's not a machine. We really need to reconnect with our own bodies. Okay, now, as, as, a, as a person who has her moon in Taurus, I would... You know, that's, that's a natural, natural way of being for me is to think in terms of bodies because Taurus is the most earthy earth sign there is. And, and yet I'm a Sagittarius, which is very philosophical, very oriented towards the larger picture. 
So I'm just kind of bringing in astrology here to uh, kind of illustrate how I think has to do with who I am. Okay, so here I am. Now, my mind is changing because it's letting go of everything it thought was real. And I got to the point where I was at the limits of what we call sanity. Okay, common sense, sanity. My sanity was dissolving. So, geez, now what? I mean, it was clear I wasn't living in the world that everybody was living in now. It really scared me. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. And I used to go to the mirror every day, like, who is this now? You know, who, who is she now? And one day I was at the mirror, and I heard this voice, which I'd heard before, which I'd heard before at that point, so I knew how to trust this voice. And it said, don't worry. Just keep going. Don't get stuck. And that's absolutely key, a key piece of advice. Wherever you are, don't worry, just keep going. Don't get stuck. And that afternoon, I got more information, which was that someday you will help other people go through the same transformation that you are going through. You know, I didn't take that very seriously, but it did lodge in, my, in, the, in the bottom of my right brain. Okay. So, meanwhile, um, I was interested in what's called developmental psychology as a philosopher, which is Piaget's theories that the child learns through stages. And then at the end of the 12th year, the final stage is reached whereby the child is now functioning as, an, as basically as an adult in society in terms of the mind. And what does that mean? It means now one's ideas are completely separated from the body and um, or from the objects that they represent and one can manipulate the ideas and um, that is the the way our society thinks as I already explained you know not very exhaustively but I at least touched on and uh, what that meant was that for me it's like what that's the end of it at 12 we're done okay keep that thought in mind because when we get to astrology it shows developmental stages that go on and on and on. The 12 year is a Jupiter cycle. Jupiter cycle is 12 years long. So astrology, what it does is study arcs of meaning that are established through time, through circles, which are that or cycles, which go through arcs and then come back to where they were for the first time. So at 12, we have a Jupiter return for the first time. 24, another Jupiter return, 36, another Jupiter return, and so forth. Jupiter has to do with our larger picture of the world. Our, it rules Sagittarius. Okay, so my, my conceptual framework had melted down, um, and luckily I was able to get through graduate school anyway because I uh, picked up a philosopher who also knew that something was deeply wrong with the way we were thinking in our culture, that the, the fundamental assumptions of our culture were, were really deadly to everyone. And so I got my degree and then I went to, to, to um, teach at, a, at an experimental college from which then I was fired uh, after one year. And now that was the most important turning point because the firing meant that I was stopped in my tracks, completely stopped in my tracks. When did that happen? At the Saturn return, which Saturn is a 30-year cycle. Um, and Saturn has to do with, you know, karma. It has to do with actions and their consequences. So what had happened, I became ego-ridden. I became too full of myself. I thought that I, I would, you know, I was just as dogmatic as I used to be, but with a completely different worldview now. And so there I was again, I had to be stopped in my tracks and that did it. And then after that, I was like totally depressed and living with um, two women who were learning how to do astrology. Now we finally get to astrology. They were learning how to set up charts. Now that's not an easy thing to do. You have to learn some mathematics. You have to follow through with the procedure with each, each chart that you set up. Uh, now we don't even have to do it because the computer program does it for us. But that shows how few astrologers there were back then because it, it did take some training to be able to even set up a chart. So they were learning how to do that. And then one of them said to me, and I was in a very depressed state, and they said to me, well, would you, would you like me to set up your chart? I said, yeah, but I don't want you to read it for me. Uh, yeah, set that, that 
why not? You know, what the, what the fuck? What if this is a map? What if this is a map? What if this helps me understand what happened to me in my life? I've lost everything. I lost my marriage. I'd lost my children by this time, even though I did see them in the summers. I lost my job. I lost my career. I lost my future. What's going on? So she set up my chart. And this was an incredible moment because I sat there at the kitchen table and I had open the ephemeris, which is, the, I wish I had it here, the book of uh, daily changes of the planets. And I knew how to read it. They had showed me how. And I thought to myself, if this is real, then during that year when my mind completely um, you know, dissolved when my conceptual helmet completely dissolved. And it, you know, once it started, by the way, there was no stopping it. It wasn't like I could, I could, you know, decide to do something else. It would felt completely compelling and left me, uh, like, uh, incredibly disturbed in terms of what this world was like and versus what I was like. But in any case, so if that, if the astrology is real, then that year will show at least one outer planet, which means the planets have, which have cycles longer than our lifetimes, at least one of those will be on top of, will have transited to one of my personal planets, which are my short cycle planets. Why did I know that? I mean, I must have been an astrologer before, because that kind of question doesn't come out of the blue. And so as I was picking up the ephemeris to look it's like I knew that if this is real, then I'm going to have to spend my life doing it. And it's what's going to help me help other people. It will be the thing that will be the fulfillment of that prophecy that someday I would be helping other people go through the same thing that I was going through at that time. And sure enough, the planet Neptune, which has a 165-year cycle, came to then very slowly and never happened again, just that one year, right to my Mars, right to it, right on it, boom. Neptune is what opens up the right brain. Neptune, um, coupled with Mars and Sagittarius, it's like not just the brain open, but there was a drive to open it, to drive to go further and further and further out. So now it turns out I was gonna learn a language which shows that that is totally possible because what we're dealing with, we're dealing with each person being the absolute center of an infinite universe. And if the universe is infinite, then the circumference is nowhere. So everybody is in the center. And that is such a beautiful concept to think of everybody is totally unique, totally in the center of the universe. And then each of us is surrounded by a series of concentric rings going outwards from that center, who we are, out into infinity, basically. But we, you know, in practice, we stay with the solar system. So the largest cycle that we've discovered so far, that's an actual planet, though some people say it's not even a planet, is Pluto, which has a 248-year cycle. So, but obviously, any planet longer than one's lifetime has a different influence than one which you can actually complete a cycle of. Because, you know, just in life, if you complete a cycle with somebody, you know it's done. And it, it, it feels like at the end, there's a meaning that flows in that, that you understand. But if you're dealing with an outer planet, and the outer planets are the unconscious planets that, that really are like the zeitgeist, is how the zeitgeist is flowing, then you're dealing with powers that are way beyond our understanding, I almost like to think of them as gods, you know, like just when they, when, when we open to the God, when we open to one of these energies, who knows what's going to happen. So it's really wise to have a strong um, direction and a strong focus, uh, a strong Saturn, in other words, if you're going to open to these energies. You'll never understand them, but you can um, align with them as they move you in a larger direction that you knew was even you were even capable of. So the reason I study astrology, so that was the opening. I had to study astrology. I didn't even know why, but I had to study it. And the reason why 
you know, it turns out is because I want to help people discover their own center and their own potential, which is frankly limitless. And um, it's very hard for people to recognize when they are still inside a conceptual structure, usually the one that, um, usually science, sometimes religion, but um, always quote common sense where we have no, no senses of common, which of course isn't true once you open the right brain you bet we're completely connected to everything. Okay, so one other thing I want to just say, because people then still, even, even back then, they'd say, well, why do you believe in astrology? You know, there's the typical question. And I'd say, why do you believe in English? In other words, that's a category mistake to speak philosophically. Um, astrology is not a belief system. It's a language. It's a symbolic language which helps us identify patterns in our lives that are both spatial and temporal. When I was in graduate school, I asked my teacher, he said, what do you want to, what do you want to study? This is a, a, for an essay. Uh, what do you want to, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to study time. And he said, he looked at me, he said, that's way too difficult. Pick something easier. So as an astrologer, it turns out that's what I'm studying. I study the arcs of the planets as they travel through space and define wholeness, holes in time, by the cycles of the planets. I hope that's clear. Um, and each, it's symbolic, so each planet has radiating meaning. It, they can be multivalent. So Jupiter, for example, to use that 12-year cycle that I talked about, um, it, it's largesse, generosity, expansion, um, luck, benevolence, it's also gambling, going way too far, uh, getting ego ridden, and so on. Everything has that, has that. You can use it on a conscious level or an unconscious level. And there's always a gradation there from unconscious to conscious. Um, I think that's all I need to do. Oh yes, just to say that since that time I have learned to make the left brain a servant of the right brain. So the right brain is where this symbolic language lives. But I use the left brain, which is logic, to give me threads of meaning, to give me ways of, of uh, going from one point to another, um, you know, to connect the dots. You do that through the left brain, but, that's, but there's always this larger, 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 larger. There's never an end to the largeness of what we can understand if we open the right brain. So I might have called this instead how I open my right brain. <laughs> but maybe, but it's more like the language of astrology helps one open one's right brain because you have to start thinking symbolically in order to actually learn it. So that's all I have to say, thanks.